Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, including the stuff from Crown Zenith, make sure you check out the Town store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code Omnipoke. For today's video, myself and Jack are going to be talking about the top 10 decks in the Crown Zenith format. Now, we already have had one regionals in this meta, but we still have plenty more regionals to come in this meta game. <laughs> and we have the OCIC as well. So we are stuck with this meta for a while. It's a long ways off until Scarlet and Violet. Uh, but already we're starting to see uh, possibly a couple new cards creeping into decks, but also we're seeing uh, a similar story in the Silver Tempest meta. Yeah, so taking a look at some data just before we get into things, um, obviously this is, or the immediate graphic is from the most recent Orlando Regional, so that was actually a tournament that took part or took place in the Crown Zenith format, so um, keep in mind this was sort of the day one uh, meta share, so again things will shift as uh, tournaments go on, but this was kind of what people were playing in the first tournament. Um, and then alongside on the right hand side we have the total cumulative points of each of the decks uh, this is not just for that one tournament, but it's also for the Silver Tempest meta, just because the metas are so similar. Uh, we decided to include that as well, just to give it a bit of a better scope. As you can see, Lugia is literally like head and shoulders and everything else above everything else, which is kind of a, a well, not really going to change, we don't think. Lugia is still very good, nothing much has changed. But um, there are some changes, so even though we've got like a list here, uh, there are some things that have moved around based on some of the Crown Zenith cards, and we expect this to this list to slightly shift as we go forward with the points and stuff. So uh, yeah, that this is kind of where we're basing our data from. Let's start off with number ten. Then we have Vikavolt V. Um, it's trying to be that turbo engine that gets that early paralyzing bolt against mostly single prize matchups, but has a number of other like attacking threats in there. The Raikou and the Drapion definitely going to be important. Uh, cards for specific matchups helping you race uh, in terms of things you're trying to target you are trying to be a little bit frustrating for those lost box variants you can see has pretty good times into those uh, you would think with the drapion especially with the sky seal stone uh, that we're going to have in our most recent list you should feel a little bit favored there the lugia is always shaky um, you're much happier going first into that matchup to try and establish uh, your lock much more guaranteed rather than having to have a really good hand. Um, and we are playing a path and judge in our list as well to try and make things difficult for them rather than relying on Aerodactyl V-Star. Um, Aerodactyl V-Star still can be a card in the deck list, but it's one that we're not currently choosing to play right now. Some of the worst stuff is Arc Dura and Yveltal Control for the same reason, really, uh, because you're so reliant on special energy, so easy for them to run you out of resources, and you're also a little bit weak into the Regis. Although the Paralyzing Bolt is annoying for them, they just have so much time to set up in your face, and they can even just, like, Reggie gate their way towards their combo, and then they can use things like Reggie Rock to hit you pretty hard, and it's really just you trying to hang on for as long as possible, hoping and praying that a Paralyzing Bolt sticks long enough that you can sort of run them out of guys, but uh, typically that's not going to be too much of a winning strat. Let's have have a look at the deck list. Like I said, uh, the one new card from Crown Zenith is going to be the Sky Seal Stone. Obviously really helpful into the Mew matchup with that Drapion combo, but also we have uh, Raikou, which can try and uptrade into Lugia for an additional prize card, which I think is going to be really important here. Um, choosing to play Judge Path rather than Aero because a lot of Lugias are choosing to play Skylar or Irida alongside Cancelling Cologne, which really does just ruin the whole combo of Aero. And it also means you just get to play a slightly more streamlined deck. Um, Path to the Peak is a really frustrating card, especially when many Lugias opt to have Pump Kaboo, which is a ball searchable card that you're blocking with Paralyzing Bolt, or they choose to play Lost Vacuums, which again, you're blocking with Paralyzing Bolt. So as long as Lugias choose to play no stadiums, you're really hindering their outs to actually bounce this path to the peak under item lock. So it can be a really nice option, even when you are going second. And Aerodactyl was typically a card you would try and utilize when you were going first. And I always think it's much more reasonable to cover your bases when you're player two rather than player one, because you're already at a small advantage. So I think this is the slightly more well-rounded way to go. And um, yeah, it's not too different from what we've seen previously, but just slightly more streamlined. Path also helping out against Lost Boxes in general, because you're also hurting the concealed cards from their Greninjas, and stopping their draw potential is also uh, really, really important. 
for tech options, uh, we've got the Aerodactyl V-Star. Uh, if you do want to go down this route, there are other upsides to Aerodactyl. It's actually pretty decent in Mirror because it's a fighting type. It's also good against some of the Arceus variants um, as an attacking presence, which is actually kind of interesting and something that you are really lacking is damage output with this deck. So you also don't enjoy coming up against things like Gudra. I think that's why Vikavolt has recently taken more of a backseat because Gudra's come out of the woodwork in the last couple tournaments. Um, so giving yourself maybe some alternate attacking lines could be pretty interesting for the deck. And Forest Seal Stone, if you don't believe in the Sky Seal Stone package, or if you just want to have a more consistent, uh, more reliable turn one item lock, I think the Star Alchemy can be a great option for you. Because of course, uh, we can still tutor these from Muse for the time being, and give yourself really good odds of just getting your Melanie combo to, uh, together. It's always a nice thing to have. So if the Sky Seal Stone is too flashy, or if you're not finding it at the right times, you could convert back to this um, V-Star option. Next up, we have Palkia Inteleon. Um, Palkia Inteleon is a deck that's kind of uh, turned into this sort of counter deck rather than a front runner of the format. Um, it's basically a, always had one of the uh, sort of best engines in terms of tutoring out the cards you need with Inteleon and Irida. Um, has fantastic support. Water still has great support. Um, so there's definitely lots to like about the archetype in general. Again, like I say, it's turned into sort of this uh, counter style deck where uh, you know, you're playing things like Articuno and Ice Q to um, try and counter some of these top decks rather than actually being uh, the attacking presence that Palkia once was. But it's still a very, very good attacker overall and still uh, great at just closing out games and things like that. Um, because of these kind of tech options, it typically has, or it feels like this kind of deck um, is very much dictated on what other decks are playing right now. So, um, you know, the Articuno. Uh, even though it's only it says it's slightly favored here on our matchup spread, the Articuno, uh, if people aren't respecting it, aren't playing bird keeps and stuff, is a really, really strong win con against Lugia. Uh, the Ice Q wash water combo is uh, brilliant. And against Lost Box and Reggie, as you can see, the Reggie's matchup is great. But even though there's a couple of um, weakness, it says here in the data, the uh, Lost Box matchup is quite weak. That's usually like that really depends on whether they're respecting Ice Q or not. Um, you know, there's certain things that we can add in as well to help support that. But uh, yeah, it's it's turned into this sort of deck that really uh, you have to pick your week to play it. Um, with the list we're going to take a look at is going to be Ian Rob's list from this weekend because, because realistically, there's not too many other ways you can really play this deck right now, in our opinion. Uh, it's just as I've mentioned, trying to. Um, play a really nice consistent engine in terms of tutoring out the pieces you need and then using those specific pieces in the specific matchups where you need them. So you've got the Articunos for dealing with uh, or trying to uh, capitalize on not many Lugas playing Birdkeeper right now. You've got the Ice Q and the Washes to try and deal with some of these one prize uh, or yeah, these one prize basic matchups. You've got Coronable to be able to blow stuff up that's trying to be too tanky, things like the Gudra uh, and the uh, Duraladon. So you know, lots of options. Then you've got the Drapion in there as well. So, uh, yeah, it's it, there's not really much you can do with the list. So we actually haven't got uh, any changes from Ian's list. And we actually don't have any major tech options as well because this feels like it's the best 60. It's just uh, rather than this deck sort of alternate or changing cards, this is a brilliant 60 if the week is right for it and if uh, lists aren't respecting things like Articuno and Ice Q and stuff. But now Ian has done well with it. Now this is a bit more of a known quantity again. We're likely to start seeing this revolving door where... Uh, you know, people will start respecting this. This deck will not be particularly good. Then when no one's playing it, people will stop respecting it. And then again, uh, it might be time to play Palkia again. So uh, it may not be the strongest play for OCIC just because it's done. It did really well this weekend. It may still be early enough that people haven't, uh, people sort of haven't decided that they're going to pull the trigger and add in these cards to try and help deal with things like Articuno and, I Articuno and Ice Q. They're instead just going to say, no, only one play person played it. Not many people others, uh, not many people are going to play it as well. Not many others are going to, um, you know, pull the trigger. So I'm not going to respect it. And that's where, that's the kind of meta that Palkia could uh, really, really do well in. So yeah, 60 wise, we think this is a pr pretty strong 60. It's just about whether you want to take that risk or whether you're going to respect people respecting this deck and maybe pick something else uh, ready for OCIC. On to number eight, then, we have Arceus Draladon still hanging on in there, doing its thing, where we're using that Arceus for early game acceleration as well as consistency, powering up the big Draladon and trying to allow the Skyscraper ability to be a huge headache against some big archetypes, whilst also having, oftentimes, Parasol to even make yourself even more safeguarded against other styles of attacks. Um, some of your weakest matchups still include Mew, always has been, just because Echoing Horn is pretty much a mainstay in Mew, and they have such raw aggression. Um, you're pretty coin-flippy on the Lugia matchup. I think you're pretty... 
decent going first into them and pretty bad going second into them. I think it's actually pretty much that simple. You can try and catch them off guard with parasols and it becomes a race to how quickly they can find their answers and how quickly you can also boss his orders up. Their Archaeops is also a big uh, factor in that matchup. Um, but you can be hitting some of the fringe stuff fairly well. I think your Yuvelto control matchup is actually far worse than it looks on paper because they can Elder Goss cape loop you and you don't have any variable damage output. So it should actually be one of your worst matchups. But the data right now is saying that it's very good. That could just be people not knowing how to play uh, the control deck online, of course. Um, so those are a few things to bear in mind. Uh, but the list is, again, pretty straightforward, pretty streamlined. It is actually one of the bigger boasts of Arc Dura, as these other decks are getting more rock, paper, scissory and having text for text for text for text. As we go further down that rabbit hole and other decks are getting less consistent and being forced to play these other cards, Arc Dura just kind of chills, kind of just does its thing. It's only real tech cards, you would say, are the big parasols. <laughs> it has Lost Cities to help out against Lost Box and also against Reggie's. And that seems to be just a pretty straightforward, simple way of playing the deck list right now. As for other options, if you want to have Collapse Stadium, it has some upside into the Reggie matchup, you know, comparatively to Lost City, where they're both trying to do a similar thing. But the Collapse also has upside into the Mew matchup, which is one of your hardest ones. And every now and then you can stifle their draw a little bit throughout the game, which is especially good into the path judge base builds of Mew because they are a little bit more cloggy and their cow stadium to a collapse is typically a path and that's no good for them. So uh, yeah, that can be a decent option. And Big Charm again, pretty handy against uh, Lost Box because you can push yourself up to 360, uh, which is uh, pretty handy here and there. It's going to be a, that little bit chunkier and also very good into the Reggie matchup as well, where you can tank a Gigas hit even with a choice belt on the turn they path. So as long as you can then bounce the stadium again, you can possibly have another turn of survival, another attack with your main guy. That's kind of the tech cards I would consider really for Arc Dura, but it's just doing its thing, chilling. I don't think it's ever got the consistency to really go much higher above this list, but it's just doing its thing. It's just vibing and uh, you get <laughs> to do the same strat every game basically, which is appealing for some players. The other Warly deck uh, of the format, Hisuian, Gudra V-Star, Lost Zone Gudra is going to be our number seven. Um, yeah, very, very similar in sort of strategy in some aspects to that um, Arceus Duraldon where you're just trying to uh, create a couple of really, really uh, big threats to, for the opponent to deal with. Uh, typically, you're going to have really strong matchups in some of the one prize uh, loss box decks, which is uh, one of the main appeals for this kind of archetype. Rolling Iron is just fantastic for not only dealing with whatever they're um, attacking you with, but also putting yourself up to effectively 350 for just two prizes is insane. And then being able to lean into that moisture start is also really, really strong. Um, your Lugia matchup is a bit sketchy. I think um, in general, it's not great. You really have to rely on uh, some awkward things like, uh, you know, Temples of Sinnoh and stuff like that. Um, but eventually, if you can get, get to the point where you're able to uh, build up a couple of Gudras, they can sometimes run out of damage. I think in general, it's a bit of a... Uh, you have to sort of hit and hope, and it's going to be one of your rough matchups realistically. But this is a deck that's really, really strong uh, into some of these one prize decks, which is sort of the main appeal of it, really. Um, looking at the list, we have uh, basically, you know, something that's, um, well, trying to keep it as simple as possible. It's very similar to uh, Evenoff's list from Liverpool that did well in the last Silver Tempest regional. As you can see, um, you, we've got those Temples of Sinnoh. We've got the uh, sort of variety of uh, additional attackers. We've got the Cramorant um, along with the Drapion as well to help uh, well help out in the Mew matchup. Um, but yeah, realistically, you're just trying to uh, do things as consistently as possible. Be um, a Lost Zone deck that uh, kind of similar to the Lost Zone engines that we've uh, seen, but actually having this payoff of uh, trying to generate to 350 HP um tanks that just people can't get through which is uh you know pretty appealing i think it's one of the riskier ones because you uh there is uh, a lot of two prizes and there is that downside of uh there are various different things that still can one shot through you which is a shame um but i think uh you know the combination of things like temple uh, plus roxanne or just roxanne in general um plus having huge hp can actually lock some decks out for long enough that you're able to take those six prizes which is pretty nice uh tech wise um, big Parasol is probably one of the biggest ones. That's one of the ways that um, Lugias will try and get through you is just blowing you up with a you, uh, an amazing Ray uh, That This sort of gets around that, which is nice. So then they have to uh, deal with a Parasol as well as a Temple, which obviously can be quite difficult, especially uh, given that some lists have started cutting some of these options and some lists are down to like just double lost vacuum, which is obviously they have to find both of those in one turn. And then if you're um, able to then stick another temple or something, you can really lock them out, which is nice. 
Um, Cheryl works as kind of a second, uh, a double dip into Moisture V Star, which again is nice into these decks that are just going to try and chip away at you. Maybe they're going to try and um, just place damage counts on you and stuff like that. So um, that works out for trying to, again, maybe you're less reliant on getting out a second and you're just going all in on one uh, big Gudra and just trying to Moisture V Star and then Cheryl later on because you're always able to Mirage Gate back onto it, which is nice. And then finally, Zamazenta. Zamazenta is still, I think, one of the best one prize attackers we've got. It didn't see too much play um, in uh the most recent orlando regionals but i still think there is huge merit there and it works so perfectly with this kind of deck you're already running great energy for it um, it's another brilliant one prize attacker that can trade up which is sometimes one of lugia's weaknesses not lugia's uh gudra's weaknesses um is that you're capped at 200 which is uh, into some of these um v and v star decks uh, that can be a bit awkward sometimes you need just that little extra push uh, to be able to take some additional prizes and keep up the tempo of the game, especially if you're not doing too much in the early turns because you're just trying to get to that uh, Mirage Gate and Gudra number. So, yeah, really nice uh, additional one prize option that uh, can uptrade in the mid to late game as well. So, yeah, some options there for you. It feels like um, I feel like there's more counterplay with this kind of deck compared to something like a Duraludon, but I feel like they act quite similarly in terms of you're just trying to build a big threat um, and wall out your opponent whilst chugging through some consistent damage and seeing what you can do um i think like like i say this has a bit more flexibility to it and i feel like you have more game into your bad matchups whereas arctura just sometimes feels like you turn the cards over and you've either won or lost kind of there and then and there's not masses you can do it's a fairly linear game plan so if this is something that's a bit more or if that's something that's um a bit more your play style maybe arctura is for you but if not maybe gudra is uh, a way to go on to number six then, we have Yveltal Control. We're trying to wrap this all up in a bow, but we know this can come in a couple different forms. But at its core, that Cry of Destruction is a huge win con against a couple of the biggest decks in the game. The Mew and the Lugia are both archetypes centered completely around special energy. You also randomly catch Viker Bolts in the crossfire, which is really nice. Um, and then you try and find a way to find common ground against Lost Zone, as well as Reggie decks, either with an Ice Cube Wash Water package or a Flying Pikachu Parasol package to create uh, lone board state checkmate scenarios by spamming that one attack over and over again. Uh, for those decks between the cracks, the likes of Arcdura, the likes of Gudra, you're hoping that they have just a low enough damage output that a uh, Cape of Toughness Elder Goss can bounce between these uh, throughout the game uh, and never deck out. The, the Elder Goss makes you infinite and you just slowly undo their damage every single turn. That's going to be uh, the emphasis of this archetype. It did pretty well in the most Orla uh, most recent Orlando regionals uh, and it was utilizing the Ice Cube package with Wash Water and Cape of Toughness. I think Cape was already a great card in the deck because it can buff up your Yveltals to prevent um, the... Luminion bounce uh, into the deck from Lugia players, so Cape is now utilized in more matchups where you can make your Ice Q a 170 hit point Mon, which is allowing you to be really safe, to be honest. Um, it creates massive combos for the opponent to even um, get through the Ice Q, even if they are playing some soft tech cards like one Sinnoh or like one Echoing Horn, they have to have a huge combo and still have one hit carry potential at their disposal through a wash, which is really, really nice for you. Um, so they may need to have multiple tech cards, not just one, to get through caped, wash-watered ice cues, uh, which is actually pretty scary. It tries to make it all happen with the Greninja draw engine. It has Keen Eye at its disposal with uh, Starly. I've added in a uh, sudden, tra sudden Transformation Ditto, which actually also made day two in the most recent regional. Uh, but I'm just playing a one-of here and kind of like uh, a limited package of attacking threats. But it does give you essentially a second Starly into the Lost Box matchup, which seems really appealing to double dip Keen Eye to help you accumulate more of these pieces for an Ice Q uh, win con. And it also acts as just that 50 Veltol, which is also really nice. Sometimes that extra Lecky, now that we've just gone down to one copy in the deck list, it seems to fill the cracks very nicely. But overall, very similar 60 to what we saw from the American Contingent, Azul and Co. And uh, it seems to be doing a pretty good job. But if you're feeling like people are answering the Ice Cube, you can always convert back to the Flying Pikachu VMAX Parasol package that we saw from Sander. You then get the upside of... Um, Speed Lightnings being slightly better than Wash Waters because they can draw you cards throughout the game regardless, which is pretty handy. But the Pikachu combo itself is maybe a little bit more convoluted. Uh, and then there's also a couple other uh, disruptive cards you could think about in the decklist. Yellhorn could be a way that you can force more retreats out of 
um, certain Pokemon, or when you get to that late game scenario and you have established the boss's orders and the um, Galar mine, and then you drop the Yellhorn on them as well, you can really put them in devastating positions, give yourself wiggle room to make certain attacks, uh, knowing that you get a f turn of freedom here and there. And also there's the option of Echoing Horn as well, just again adding to that boss Galamine trap strategy, which is oftentimes part of your late game win condition once you've run your opponent out of resources, at least against the Mew players and the Lugia ones. So you can bring back some awkward mons here and there, which is always uh, a decent option as well. Next up onto our top five, uh, first of which is Reggie Gigas at number five. Uh, I feel like everyone kind of knows what this deck is now. It's very much... Uh, been around for a little while, um, trying to hit for weakness and hit for um, or, or trying to capitalize on the um, the, the different attackers in, the, in within the deck to be able to hit for different weaknesses. So you've got uh, Eleki for Lugia, you've got Gigas to um, try and beat down some VMAX Pokemon, uh, but you've got other things like the Regice, the uh, Reggie Rock as well for different weaknesses here and there, um, as well as you know it all it's all wrapped up in a bow with the uh, Reggie Drago to try and help you draw through your deck. Um, realistically, nothing much has changed about the deck. It's still pretty much where it was. It still pretty much has a very similar matchup spread as it always has. It's uh, very much more about beating yourself as Reggie than beating what's in front of you. It has great options for a lot of things. It's one of these one prize decks that actually isn't uh, filled with really low HP Pokemon, so you're actually able to trade up uh, quite well, which is really nice. Um, the biggest issue with Reggie's has basically always been trying to just uh, not brick and out con uh, be consistent enough to be able to play the game. And that's still the uh, biggest thing to uh, kind of contend with. I still think there's um, issues with the deck's consistency, but overall you have fairly positive matchups. I mean, you've got, look looking at that, you've got a positive Lost Box matchup, a positive Lugia matchup, and a positive Mew matchup, all only slightly, but, you know, that's they're the, they're the kind of numbers you want to be seeing. You have not as strong of a matchup in some of these fringe things, but um, in general, having a strong matchup against en any of the decks that we haven't talked about already is evidently going to put you in a good position. So yeah, it's all as with Regigigas as it always has been. It's just about making sure you're getting into the game and then able to play the game. And once you are, you're naturally going to be in a good position. We feel. Looking at the list, um, in general, we we it's kind of well, lists kind of change all the time, but realistically, there's they're never too far from each other. Um, we've still got the heavy paths and stuff like that choice belts plus path to try and get through things like Duraladon that naturally will try and wall you um but in general just you know it pretty much is doing uh as it all as it always has done we have got the rope in here as well just to um try and deal with anyone going for uh sort of an early wash uh or early an ice cube play against you you still have a bit of flexibility there um but yeah in general like the the deck isn't <laughs> doing too much realistically um differently than it always has been it's just hoping to get into the game um and hoping to uh you know deal with whatever is what is in, whatever's in front of you if you can start turbing through your deck and get to the point where uh, you're not drawing into or you're drawing into things the things you need you're able to discard energy early enough and you're able to trade up into various different uh various different attackers in the format oh so <laughs> i completely forgot about the other options there are a couple of other options um so yeah boss uh, obviously in in combination with um, the rope and stuff can help with some of these one prize matchups uh, or these one prize counters like the ice cube. Um, similarly with Yellhorn, trying to uh, deal with things like that as well as just um, you know trying to get through various different um, other things that are trying to wall you out and stuff like that. Pokestop is also an additional consistency option. Uh, again, binning off the energy is really, really important um, as well as just turboing through Realistically, it feels like if this deck can start getting down to sort of the 20 and 25 card mark early, early in the game, a lot of what's left in your deck doesn't really matter because uh, you're playing out of the discard and off the board at that point. You're able to just find the rods and things like that to keep cycling in the tool, uh, the Reggies that your opponent's trying to target and stuff like that. So whilst uh, this, it, it's like a bit of an awkward card in some decks, I feel like it really works. But I think path is still really important. So probably playing a split of those is um, pretty key. I think five stadiums has been like played in the past. And it's really important to make sure you're winning stadium war because of things like collapse just completely walling you here and there. So um, I think Pokestop is still still definitely has merit. But um, being one of the best path decks right now is actually still really, really appealing. Um, again, I mentioned how people are starting to sort of, you know, 
cut um, some of their stadium answers and things like Lugia and stuff. So that's another area that you can really capitalize and just try and buy yourself some time. Because again, the longer, the, the more turns this deck has and the longer or the quicker it's able to get down to the bottom and um, start just cycling the attack as it needs. Realistically, it feels like it, that's where it's going to start to shine. So yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's definitely a deck that doesn't really change too much and hasn't really changed for a little while but as long as you can get over the sort of consistency factor um i'm pretty sure you're able you're going to be able to have a strong tournament um but it's just always that one <laughs> that one sort of consistency thing that i think holds people back and sometimes people just um aren't too worried about it and just go with it but um yeah i think that's the main issue with the deck um going into well any tournament really on to our first lost box variant we're going to have a look at uh, Raikwaza. Uh, the combination of having uh, a Raikou that can add some spread pressure, really helpful into the Regis, especially alongside Galarian Zigzagoon, and the Mirror, as long as you can target down the opponent's uh, Manaphy, which is oftentimes the back and forth you'll struggle through. And then you have the big burst one hit code potential to deal with the V Stars and the V Maxes when need be, because the amazing burst can reach silly numbers, uh, because we play usually five different types of energy within the deck list. Uh, you can try and make some crazy things happen with a combination of turn attachment, gate, even with Raihan in the deck list. It feels like uh, one of your weakest matchups is going to be the Vikavolt matchup. Um, and you're also slightly slow into the Regis. Uh, but on paper, you have answers to most things in format. I think the biggest thing you're being uh, concerned about at the moment is the amount of Ice Cube Wash Water packages going into decks and Pikachu Parasol packages. So it's whether you want to be caught within that net where so many people are trying to find that niche and say, I don't even want to try and race this deck. It's too good at racing against me. If they get their combos rolling, I'm just going to try and wall them out. So finding wiggle room against those sorts of strategies could be the new issue for this archetype going forward. And I think it actually is a big issue because the deck is so tight on space. At the moment, I've slotted in one Temple of Sinnoh because it allows you to combat the new Lugia technology of the Wash Water Manaphy combo. It allows you to still Lost Mine their Manaphy, which is really important. Um, but it also can help out against the Ice Q. But again, when you only have one Temple, is it going to be enough? Do you need to start inserting... Um, things like Lost Vacuums, which can naturally help you get to 7 in the first place or 4 in the first place for your Lost Zone, but then can also deal with things like um, Cape of Toughness, so you can go Cape, Bounce Stadium, and Lost Mine all in the turn. Um, or do you want to have the uh, Echoing Horn plays, so you can go Horn Rope in all sorts of instances, and the Echoing Horn is also, you know, has upside in all, so all sorts of other situations, so it really is determining how you want to go about your business with this deck, so that you are having respect for these uh, tech card checkmates that your opponent can try and put against you. But in general, this is a pretty simple shell of the deck list, uh, just with that one temple include as of right now. But for other options, like I said, there are ways you can try and combat these annoying Pokemon. And Giratina V might actually be the best of the bunch because you already play Psychic and Grass Energy. And Shred is just a no-nonsense card no matter if they're playing Ice Q or Flying Peak. You can Shred twice into both of them and get your KOs even into the Ice Q. You could Zigzagoon, Ping, and Shred to knock them out all in a turn and sort of surprise them. Uh, so I think a Giratina V unironically sounds like probably the best or most space efficient way but i still think you should play that temple because um it allows you to help beat the lugia even though they're not playing ice q uh, so i wouldn't be surprised if we started to see one giratina v going into decks and at that point you could even try and squeeze in the v star i know i'm getting pretty <laughs> ambitious at this point because there's not much room uh but there is an option for a restar power there's not one being utilized at the moment with the deck and the other options are just Try and keep things simple. Do your game plan as much as possible. These tech cards, they come and go. Sometimes people try and target specific metagames when they can find a niche. And then when they become a known quantity, they in general get less good. So maybe you can hope that other people do the teching for you. Uh, and you can just try and be as streamlined as possible. That's always an option for the deck. Uh, Nick Moffat's most recent list didn't play bosses orders, but it was previously in like Pablo Mazer's uh, list, what the ones that sort of many people springboarded off of. Um, so that's a debate whether or not you want to have any gust in the deck or just always hit through what's in the active or be forced okay. to only have rope. Uh, that's just a small debate there. Um, from my own personal experience, I've not used boss too often. 
Uh, it often does find its way into the Lost Zone, um, to be fair, uh, but it does give you some panic situations that you can worm your way out of. So uh, something to definitely bear in mind, but it seemed to be a slot that Moffat stole, and uh, it's up to you whether or not you want to have Gust in your own li uh, 60. Onto the other Lost Zone box deck. This is the Kyogre Lost Zone box. I think before or in the past, we've kind of lumped these together, but realistically, it really feels like these are starting to uh, separate as archetypes. Um, pretty much because, uh, you know, the as Joe's just mentioned, uh, the Rayquaza list is pretty focused on dealing with whatever's in front of you, whereas Kyogre's big finish attack deals with uh, stuff on the bench. So uh, it feels like there are two different directions to this. Um, you also get additional benefit from Zamazenta, which I think is still one of our favorite cards of Crown Zenith. And um, I still think, even though it wasn't particularly popular in Orlando, there's still something there. Um, so in general, it's just like a, a different approach to um, Lost, Lost Zone Box. Your typical sort of engine is still very similar. You've still got um, Greninja and then Cram and Sableye in the early turns. Uh, but your sort of mid and late game options are slightly different. Um, and in general, that kind of, you know, in our eyes makes them different enough. And uh, I think we personally prefer this one just a little bit. Um, it, I always, I've always felt like the Rayquaza version is very combo heavy, which is fine because you have things like Raihan and you have lots of time to build up your hand. Um, and whilst this is still very, very combo heavy, it, it, it feels like you win the game with your combo with Kyogre um, a lot of the time, whereas um, there can be situations where basically you need to Rayquaza early enough because, you know, your opponent's got a Lugia in front of the, you and you can't afford to go through this in two or three turns. You have to deal with it straight away. Whereas um, typically the Kyogre can catch back up later on with Aqua Storm. So, uh, yeah, it feels like these um, decks are different enough for us to separate them. And uh, we, I, I think this one is slightly better purely in, in if i'm honest because uh, you're able to play some tempo attackers things like zamazenta and stuff which is uh, really really nice um taking a look at the list in general we haven't got any two prize options in here at the moment still got that one temple of Sinnoh that joe mentioned in the previous list um kind of for the same applications um but in general this is just a uh pure one prize list there's obviously i'll talk about the two prize options um momentarily but yeah you're able to uh, double dip on the zamazentas which is really nice you've still got um crams and sableyes to be able to deal with other one prize matchups as well as uh, having access to uh kyoga for the late game obviously the um sableye and temple combo um that counters these lugias uh playing the wash water to be able to protect their manaphy is really really uh beneficial in the kyoga build because typically um rather than just taking the one sniping ko with raikou um you'll be looking to take a second uh, with kyoga so i think it's even better in this um, and again this might be a list where you uh, perhaps want to uh, invest even more heavily into it and maybe play something like a vacuum as well so it uh, definitely could be something there but in general just a very outside of the sort of kyogre package a pretty simple lost box list overall um, Tech-wise, as mentioned, a lot of the techs are kind of similar. Lost Vacuum, Horn, to be able to try and deal with some of these uh, one prize uh, counters like Ice Q, um, and then Boss, as mentioned. But the kind of difference you can take with this um, list is the Sky Steel Sky Seal Stone package, where you can play um, one of the, one or two, or as met, like whichever your uh, favorite V Pokemon attackers are, and try and uptrade in that way as well. Typically, a lot of these um, kind of Pokemon have never really been. Um, or have only ever been kind of mediocre. They have to be timed incredibly well um, because a lot of the time they're just trading two for two and realistically you're a deck that wants uh, the game to go a little bit longer because you want to be able to um, turbo through your deck and get to uh, that uh, Mirage Gate number. So it's not always been the best option, but now you can actually trade up. Uh, it's really, really nice because it means that you're um, at least gaining sort of uh, board benefit as well in terms of taking an extra prize compared to what you were before. Um, obviously, Drapion is uh, fantastic at dealing with Mew as well, which can sometimes just um, sort of laugh at you trying to leap in and stuff like that. Uh, but I think already the Kyogre package is quite strong against them. Um, so I think uh, Drapion isn't massively necessary. I think Raikou is actually one of the better ones just because you would get the additional card draw and it's only a two energy attack, which is nice. It means that, uh, you know, you're able to just um, have a gate and be happy with it and, you know, um, look for or use your energy, other energy elsewhere. But obviously having to, the previous list that we showed, um, played metal energy rather than uh, lightning energy. So that's where things start to get into that sort of Rayquaza energy <laughs> style. So it's, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's all kind of like swings and roundabouts, but 
Um, I do think Raikou is one of the better ones. We did see a really impressive Dragonite V deck um, that's not wasn't quite as it was far more turbo than this one, but we saw the benefits of Dragonite V. It's got a really strong attack at dealing with Vs, which means you're basically always going to be taking three prizes on a an evolving V, which is fantastic, and it does have that upside of Shred as well. It's a fairly low damage shred, but it's probably one of the better shreds uh, for this deck compared to like Giratina where you're not running the right energy. So uh, yeah, these are all definitely options. I think um, the Sky Seal package has been a bit underwhelming overall, but uh, again, it could be one of these things where because uh, we get to a point where people just don't expect it at all, they feel really comfortable sitting on three prizes and then all of a sudden you're able to uh, burst out a Sky Seal Stone Riker or something and uh, able to trade up and just win the game from nowhere. So that in combination with uh, like the Kyogre means you really can catch up with this deck, whereas uh, some other lost, bo lost boxes, you really have to trade one for one quite uh, early on into the game. So uh, yeah, this deck feels like it's all about catch-up mechanics, which sometimes can be a bit risky because, again, they can be played around, they can be uh, expected. But I think at least the Kyogre package is um, definitely a really, really strong one. But um, maybe even this Sky Sealed Stone means that you can uh, have some pretty explosive turns and come back from behind really, really quickly. In at number two, then, we have Mu V Max. Uh, for the longest time, it's kind of split between the disruption base build with Judge and Path, as well as the Sparkle Meloetta sort of tempo base builds. Both seem to be doing relatively successfully. They are winning tournaments. They are still getting multiple top eight placements, even with so much tech going around. Uh, it's still finding a way to outdraw decks and out um, maneuver them with their hand disruption at their disposal. Uh, it seems to be kind of the 50-50 deck of the format, to be honest with you. It has a couple more weak ones. Like I think Reggie's is one of your hardest ones. Um, possibly even Yveltal or Control can be a headache for you. But you even then, you have the hand disruption, early game cheese factor. Especially now with Yveltal or Control being as low as like two Snorlax, you actually can ruin their early game quite nicely and still steal wins against them. Uh, and you do like seeing meta percentage go towards decks like Gudra, like Arcdura as well. These are some of the things that you can try and feast on because you can just try and out-tempo them and still race them very, very effectively. Uh, I'm personally on the side of Judge Path. I think that's kind of the safest route for me right now uh, because it is so strong into Lugia. And you can see those percentages, you're slightly unfavored, but basically a coin flip. And I think uh, having paths at your disposal is a big reason why you can have win percentage into that matchup. Uh, even when you are going second. So first we are going to have a look at a sample DTE-based Mew. Um, has basically just the core supporters going on here with judges with those paths in there as well. You have Roxanne for that late game push and you oftentimes proactively path yourself as well so that you don't get hit by a Drapion by certain uh, players. Certainly in a number of decks, you want to try and be proactive at denying that. You also have Lost City for making sure that Drapion goes into the Lost Zone so they only get one use out of it. But it is also, of course, a big tech card for Reggie. It's a big tech card for Lost Zone as well. Uh, so they don't have any free Lost Zone choices with their Colrus or with their Confei. They have to be extremely uh, strict and not get rid of too many Pokemon. Otherwise, you can just run them out of resources, which is really important, especially when you are hitting them constantly with this hand disruption. With the Pal Pad, the Double Judge gets used over and over again because you have so much cycle to just draw back into your combo pieces. Big Parasol trying to help out against um, the Control Uveltal as well as Amazing Ray Uveltal. Um, and other than that, it's more or less a straightforward 60. And then we jump into the Meloetta Sparkle build. This is trying to just abandon most other things for tempo. Now, I'm not playing catchers in the list. I'm just playing ropes and rotom phones, but you can easily convert these, uh, even dropping like your Serena to then just add in a number of catchers and give that a whirl. It really allows you to have the most dangerous turn ones possible if you are feeling lucky and able to manage those head flips because that uh, Melodious Echo still can be extremely dangerous. Decks have to really respect that Mew. Uh, they often have to try and get that double Vs developed if it's Lugia or if it's Mirror and whatnot um, to stand a chance. Otherwise, you can just completely blow them up and stop the game before it starts. You still do have at least um, one judge in the deck to give yourself a little bit of early game disruption against Lost Box players. And you are playing Lost Cities as your stadium to still keep Reggie's and Lost Box players honest. Uh, but you are a little bit uh, more vulnerable the list is playing Oricorio uh, to force the extra energy out of Rayquaza players to get a one-hit KO on the Mew. But other than that, again, 
fairly streamlined and straightforward. We have actually seen a Mew recently take on the Aerodactyl V-Star uh, for that V-Star power against Lugia. Uh, there's even been Camo Ponchos inserted. Now, I'm a little bit sus and sceptical of these combos. I think already going first as Mew, you should be pretty favoured just by racing Lugia, especially with Echoing Horn at your disposal. I think it shouldn't be too hard of a matchup for you. And going second path is obviously way stronger than an Aerodactyl in the first place, so I still hang my hat on those choices. If you want to just, again, stay streamlined, Broken Phone's always a decent choice. And uh, if you want to have a Collapse Stadium, it can be another way at fighting Reggies. It can be um, also a great card against Lost Box, which oftentimes is trying to set up damage on Genesex and whatnot with Sprinkle Damage or with Early Cram Hits uh, or even with Greninja Pings. So um, collapsing away one of those mons can be uh, a great way to backdoor yourself into a win when it looks like they've set themselves up for game. You can steal a turn away from them and put yourself back in the driving seat, especially alongside things like Roxanne. That could be a massive combo for you. And on to number one, to no one's surprise, it is Lugia V-Star. Uh, it's still the best deck. It's been the best deck for a while now, and it's uh, come out swinging. It still had, uh, you know, six top eight placements this weekend, which was, uh, you know, pretty crazy. I think <laughs> no one's really been surprised, but uh, it was really, really dominant this weekend, and I don't think there's uh, going to be anything changing anytime soon regarding that. Um, in general, sort of, you, the deck has evolved into just being this um, sort of plethora of different uh single prize and also two prize options to try and uh capitalize on each of the different uh matchups in the format and um realistically i feel like this are pretty much getting there it feels like this are down to like 30 uh, down to like 55 56 cards pretty much certain and it's just um sort of some tech options here and there uh, in general but you've got really really strong matchups across the board you can see that there's not many not many matchups here that are marked as under 50 50 um so yeah, you're you're super consistent. I think going first, you are incredibly strong, um, and the the whole format is looking to answer you rather than anything. So if you're just looking for a deck that uh, is really really consistent and just very very powerful, Lugia is definitely um, still up there for sure. Uh, taking a look at the list um, in general, this is really really close to the uh, three lists that all did. Um, really well from Isaiah Bradner and his testing group. Uh, Isaiah Bradner, Reagan Retzlov, and John Eng all top eighted with very, very well with identical lists. We've uh, made a couple of changes here and there, but um, in general, very, very close to that. Uh, it feels like the attacking package is pretty much sorted now in Stoutland, Yveltal, Sharazard, and Raikou. Um, still got the Manaphy in there as well, just because we really respect um, the uh, Kyogre Lost Box. I think that's really, really important. Always got the bird keeper in there, uh, just you know, anticipating an uptick in people trying to uh, use these paralysis strats again against you, um, as well as collapse. Just again being a pretty really good option instead of playing that second vacuum. Playing a collapse helps you into things like the Reggies and Lost Box matchups, as well as uh, ad an additional bit of healing. And also early collapse can actually be really really brutal against other Lugias because it means that they can't uh, go for like early fish plays and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, really, really nice options. In general, um, like I say, the, the list is pretty much uh, similar to the one that we saw do well recently. Um, has got the wash water and also a V-Guard in here to help people stop bouncing uh, Lumine against you, which is, I think, uh, one big thing in the matchup as well. Tech-wise, um, there's sort of the Cologne package and the Era Discarder debate that's been around for a little bit. Um, I think for now, it, it's up to you whether you want to respect um, the whole Cologne stuff, and then you do have that debate of whether you want to play Irida or Skylar. Um, I still really like the, the idea of Irida being able to play uh, like an Irida, a Lost Vacuum, uh, a Cancelling Cologne, and a Choice Belt, and just have two to four of those, whilst also getting a Luminion or the Manaphy in those key, key spots is going to be really good. But having to include things like Bird Keeper and stuff, you do have to start uh, chopping things. So uh, again, this is these are kind of all slots that go into one, and you have to work out which ones you want to be playing. Um, and then also Dunsparce, obviously, again, it's a in it's fairly it's a fairly well known capacity that one of the best ways people are trying to counter Lukia is things like Amazing Rare Raikou or just regular Raikou V. So um, we haven't played we're not playing Dunsparce right now, but Dunsparce is definitely justifiable in there. Um, so yeah, another one to keep in mind for sure. That wraps up our top ten. Then uh, Jack, we still have a regional and an SPE in this format. Uh, what are your main thoughts? Obviously, we're going to uh, look at the OCIC results, but 
for someone, if you were attending the OCIC, what deck would be top of your radar? And also, um, what are you thinking in terms of testing in the long term for those uh, future regionals? I still think Lugia is definitely up there. I think it's really proved itself again this weekend. Obviously, it didn't really have much to prove, but in general, it's shown that not many of the cards in Crown Zenith made a massive impact. Uh, admittedly, it was just the first tournament, so there definitely could be some more um, or some people sort of uh, trying more of these um, new cards. But I still think Lugia is definitely up there, and um, considering it's all all I've really played since Silver <laughs> Tempest came out, I'm pretty sure I, can, I would be sticking with it. But yeah. I do think Kyogre Lost Box is actually um, very, very, like in in the right hands and in a, in the right meta, a brilliant play. I think it's a really, really strong play. So I think I'm probably because we still have like three weeks until Bokum or a couple of weeks until Bokum. It's the weekend after OCIC. Pretty sure I'm just going to be trying some of that. Uh, if I gel with it, great. If not, back to Lugia. It's never really a bad fallback. But yeah, I think the even though even though it's only third on our. Um, top 10 list i actually think it has the potential to be the strongest deck in format um in in a lot of formats realistically in terms of uh, tech options and stuff that people are playing so yeah i'm pretty sure those two are definitely my two favorite decks but yeah what i want to be testing um i think is lost box yeah i i've been putting a lot of time into kyoga lost box myself uh, i am worried that my brain may explode over that many rounds uh, playing <laughs> the deck because it's such a strange deck to play when you're trying to keep up turn by turn, but also have enough resources to save for your late game combo. It really can be uh, a really difficult deck to play at times. And if a couple selects go wrong, it just makes every other decision that much more difficult. Um, and in 15 minutes, that can also be a big issue. Especially, it just seems like a lot of people are happy to tech so heavily against Lost Box right now, even though Lugia is the best deck in the room. Um, there's still enough meta share for Lost Box that it's really worth teching against. So mm -hmm. I'm also thinking of just DT me as a fallback and just saying, hey, I'm going to path judge cheese you. And that's just pretty good in the format as well. <laughs> so yeah. That would be my, ugh, I can't be bothered to play Lost Box <laughs> uh, back up right now. Let Makes us know sense. what you guys are thinking of playing in the Crown Zenith meta. Have you cracked any other new cards from this set or you think it, it's more of the same? We begrudgingly do have this for a huge number of tournaments to go, so we're probably going to continue to talk about Crown Zenith here and there throughout the next few months, but as uh, the days go by, we are going to start integrating new format stuff. Myself and Jack have been tinkering away at all sorts in the background. Uh, we're not too far away from the set review now, and uh, we're actually getting together this weekend to do some IRL playtesting for some tabletop uh, footage for you guys as well, so really looking forward to that. It's not going to be too long until it's on the channel. So stay tuned and we'll be back for another video tomorrow. Cheers.